All right, so we'll pick back up real quick, show you some of the progress I made while I was waiting for the parts. Did some of the interior cleaning. Again, not doing anything nuts, like running it through a car wash or putting anything in a dishwasher. Just simply everything I could reach with a towel and kind of getting it cleaned out from that point. And one of the big focal points, obviously, was the heat sinks. Went ahead and removed the output covers, cleaned everything there, and then ran a towel through all the slots of the heat sink front and back. Got all, all that mess cleaned up. So really what we're really looking at now is the front needing some attention. So we'll go ahead and remove the knobs, pull the faceplate off, and start that process. As for the caps, Panasonic, ordered 47 mic at 50 volt. That should be just fine for what we're doing here. We did make a mark on the ones that we know really should be replaced. All the other ones were perfectly fine according to ESR. So we won't mess with those. We should be able to get this thing back up and going beautifully again. So let's go ahead and get the front face off. If I remember right, I know there's retaining nuts that's holding it on, but we'll have to carefully remove our knobs, get the set screws loosened up. So we'll go ahead and set the camera up in the tripod while we do that. So give me a second for that and we'll pick back up. All right, so we'll go ahead and pick back up. I've gathered up a few tools that we'll need to get the front off of the unit. And let's go ahead and turn the heat off real quick so we don't have that noise to deal with. So yeah, I gather up a few tools that we'll need. A couple of clean towels. Well, one perfectly clean towel and one that's not so clean that we're gonna do the initial wipe off with. And as for taking the knobs off, you'll need a couple of things. We'll go over that. But the way I like to do it is I'll pull the knobs off and line them up in the same order that they came off of because we want the exact knob going back in the exact spot and when you get to the volume knob, you will need an Allen for that. And I can't emphasize the fact enough that there's two screws in this, not one, as I found out way, way, way many years ago. Sometimes it's a little hard to get it in there. There we go. Okay. And there's only one. Yeah, one. Yeah, there's only one in the uh, tuning. And these usually don't have any trouble. They all come off pretty easy. And then these, we'll take these off. And when you get ready to put your faceplate back on, your best bet is to make sure all those switches are in the up position, actually. Okay. And then you got three nuts on three of the controls that hold the bottom of it on. There's a couple of Phillips screws at the top. As for these, in an effort to not damage this, basically what I do, or what I've already done, is I'll take some electrical tape and put it on the end parts of my pliers. That way, these are not being held on very hard anyway. But this just prevents metal on metal contact and any scratching that might occur. You don't want to damage this, even though this one's not in great shape. We certainly don't want more scratches on it than it already has. And this just prevents that. And these nuts are never on really, really tight. And when you get ready to put them back on, you don't need to go crazy and crank them to the point to where you're indenting the aluminum there. And then we'll get the two Phillips screws out of the top of it.
And again, after all these years, these things are usually never like super tight. You don't usually have to fight too much. And now the face, well, let's get that one. Now our face should just slide off, maybe. There it is, right there. And so we're going to go through and get all this cleaned up. We'll do a raw cleaning, because after you take it off, it looks pretty good under here. It's just dirty through the front. So we'll do one good wipe off. And then what you can do is you can push the buttons and they'll come out further than they normally do and you can clean those and you don't have to take any of that apart. So I'm going to go ahead and get this part of it wiped down. I'm going to do it with a nasty towel first, or not a nasty one, but one that's not perfectly clean and then we'll go back over it with a good one. So give me a second for that and we'll pick back up. Okay, so we'll pick back up and just kind of get a good look at the potential here after doing a little cleaning and polishing of the front panel. I don't really think the camera is going to be able to accurately kind of show what I'm seeing. It looks real nice. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but we got all of the dirt and debris cleaned away and use a little metal polish just to get it shined up a little bit. And, uh, it does look good. I went ahead and removed all the push buttons out of the front so I could uh, take care of that area too because it was really tarnished pretty good. But uh, again, not perfect, but this is like 120% better than when he brought it to me. So this is starting to look, uh, look real good. So we got to do the knobs next. I'm probably just do those, clean those with a little Windex in the event that they need polishing. We can do that too. I don't really have any particular, there's no secret to this. It's just a simple case of using some warm water in the beginning to kind of get the layer of dirt. And uh, a lot of times uh, um, these uh, belong to people who smoke and so there's a little nicotine residue on it, no big deal. And just get that cleaned off and once you get that cleaned off then you can actually start to polish it up a little bit. And as for the polished stuff, I basically went and picked up some just seven metal polish. You can use this for pretty much any kind of metal. Stainless steel, aluminum, chrome, um, pewter, brass, bronze, copper, pretty much anything. It's ammonia based and it does a pretty good job. You probably wouldn't want to try to apply this with a you know, drill and buffer. It might remove the text off of the front of the unit, but uh, just a nice clean rag to buff it in and buff it out real quick does a good job so that's pretty much it we're gonna move on to the knobs I'm gonna get the knobs and the buttons all put back on and we'll get kind of the cosmetics out of the way and then we'll move on to changing the caps out and checking the power supply voltages but it's coming along pretty good so we'll pick back up in just a few minutes all right before we go ahead and start putting the face back on and all the knobs and all of that we do want to address getting the controls cleaned in this. And of course, it is possible with this piece back in place to blast control cleaner in through the front of these toggle switches and get them cleaned up. That doesn't help you with the volume control because there is no way to get control cleaner in from the front, but it will help you with these. But your best bet, if you got the face off of it anyway, I would say, I would argue the best bet is to do this every time you're trying to clean the controls, if you need to clean the volume control in particular. But um, your best bet is to take the three Phillips screws out and the whole assembly will just swing out to where you can have access to it. And we'll kind of zoom in a little bit here, depending on what the limitations of this camera are. And this will give us a good, good look at one of these toggle switches and how easily it is to get control cleaner right inside there where it's moving into the contacts. And you'll still get control cleaner. It'll be running out of everything, but at least you won't be, you know, blasting it all inside the unit. And so, now as far as the volume control is concerned, different story. You can peel that label off the back, just like I did right there, but that's not going to help you. That's one section, and that gear on the back is what rides against that metal, metal piece that uh, gives you the detent portion of this, makes you give that detent feel to it. But what you can do is, there's two screws that travel the entire length of all three sections of this. 
And if you start unscrewing them from the front, the nuts will come off, one on the corner here and one on the corner here. And then these sections will start to open up some. The back one opens up real far. But these two, obviously, you want to be very careful when you do this. But you can pry these apart. You can use your thumbnail and you can get control cleaner in there. And to me, that's a pretty efficient way to do it, is to just pull these apart just ever so slightly. You don't want to put a lot of force on it because it's soldered in and you don't want to break anything. But you can get control cleaner in there on both sides. You just got to be careful while you're doing it. So that's kind of my method for doing that. And so I'm going to go ahead and get all my controls cleaned up. And then I'll move down here to the tone controls. Then we'll do the function switches. And then we'll do the FM switches and the speaker switches. I mean, there's really, you know, you can, you can blast control cleaner from the front. But we're trying to do it to make sure that there's no, you know, intermittents or anything like that. We want to make sure we do it one time and don't have to do it again. So I'm going to go ahead and get all of that taken care of. And then we'll pick back up and start getting things reassembled. So give me a few minutes for that and we'll pick back up. All right, I wanted to bring you back real quick just to kind of give you my method for doing these type of um, actuated switches. You push one and it releases the other one used in the function switch uh, bank here. And uh, of course you can blast cleaner from the front into kind of the bottom part of this and get it where it needs to go. You'll use a lot of cleaner doing it, but it can be done that way. But I found this method to be a little bit better. And basically, if you look along the top of these switches, there's very slim slots on each side. And uh, what I do basically is just widen out one of those slots with a tiny drill bit. Um, basically something like this right here. You would use this and kind of, not forward, but reverse drill it. Kind of move it in counterclockwise and that will kind of pull the debris that you're cutting through away from the hole so it doesn't fall down inside the switch. And by doing it that way, towards the rear of the switch, once you actuate one of the other switches, the one that you're working on, that back hole becomes nice and empty. There ain't anything blocking it and you can get the cleaner in there and of course it will just naturally run into uh, the top part of the switch where the contacts are at for, uh, for the top part. Same thing with the bottom one. If I actuate the top one, freeze up that hole, the inside part of the switch moves towards the front, freeing up the bottom and uh, the empty hole, no problem at all, works like a champ. And uh, I did this for each one of these and got each one of these uh, switches clean. So it's a pretty good method for doing it. You've already got it apart, so it's not a big deal. This board can be a little cumbersome to get out. You have to take your time and be careful so you don't break anything, but the wiring is kind of tight. But uh, just a couple of screws and that board will move out of the way just like this one. Now, I don't personally feel the need to, once you drilled out these holes, I don't feel the need to, to fill those in or seal those back up. They're just too tiny. But where we did on the back of this volume control, where I did um, take that sticker off, it exposes a much bigger hole, so I did cut a piece of uh, 3M black tape and uh, clean this up real nice so it would stick real good and put it on the back of that volume control because we don't want big, that big of a hole exposed. But here, I just don't see the, the necessity to do it. So, But that's my method for that, making some progress, getting things done, moving on to the tone controls and the FM and speaker switches, and then we'll be re ready to put the face back on and all the knobs, and we can move on a little further down the road. So give me a few minutes for that and we'll pick back up. All right, as we come back in, went ahead and got all of the knobs, the face, everything put back together after finishing up the uh, controls, the tone controls and the speaker switches. All of that was a little cumbersome to get to, as you might imagine, but still quite doable. Of course, you'll want to do that before you put those back in. So you've got uh, maximum access to get, get the things and uh, kind of manipulate them to the point to where you can uh, get the switches cleaned up. So this is looking real nice. Not perfect, but uh, it wasn't perfect when he gave it to me, but this is 100% better than what he had. And not only that, um, 
it just has such a great look to it with everything cleaned up. I did use some of that um, metal polish on the knobs just to get those cleaned up and looking good. And uh, they are, they're looking real nice here. Um, I think the next thing we need to do, let's go ahead and I'm just gonna stand it on end and we're gonna move on to getting the cap swapped out on that uh, power supply board. We won't do them all. We can go ahead and just change a couple of them out just to get the idea, but um, we'll go ahead and get that reinstalled and uh, do a little preliminary testing after the fact just to make sure everything's still working uh, as it was in the controls. It should be working much better. So, all right, give me a second for that and uh, we'll pick back up with the uh, caps for the power supply board. All right, picking back up with you. Kind of already started the capacitor swapping process. Took out the one here, and of course the ones that we were swapping, we did make a red mark on so we'd know. Let's go ahead and we'll take this one out. We're not gonna do all of these on camera, but we'll get the general idea. Nothing too difficult about this. Basically just using a little solder wick. Yeah, I'll just pry up on the lead of it and kind of bend it up a little bit, kind of get it out of the way. And then the other one. The only time I ever really miss my desoldering tool is if I have to remove an IC with 20 or 30 pins on it. Otherwise, solder wick always does a good job. And again, we'll put our red mark so we know what it is. This one is a 47 at 35, and we're replacing them with the Panasonics that are 47 mic at 50 volt. And that's pretty much it right there. I usually don't push them all the way down to the board. We want to leave a little, little space there for air. But otherwise, it looks pretty good. So I think I'll go ahead. There's only, I think, three left on this board. We're only going to change out five. So I'll go ahead and change the remaining three. We'll get the board put back in, and we'll make sure we got what we started with. So give me a second for that, and we'll come back. Coming back, got our power supply board back installed in the unit. Everything sounded real nice. Kind of cooking it up a little bit. We'll get it warm and then we'll check the positive and negative supplies coming out of that power supply board. Well, let's enjoy this little UFO. All the controls, dead silent, pretty much. Smart speakers and more, over 250 different devices. No dropout on anything.
definitely makes a big difference pulling out the whole assembly where all the controls are and you can get to them easily and get control cleaner where it needs to go versus just kind of blasting it in from the front. I mean, that will work, but this is really your best method. I think next, let me go ahead and pull the service manual up for this one. I don't remember what those supply voltages are, 60, 70 something. We'll double check those. Maybe look at the idle current, make sure that's running good. And uh, then we'll get ready to button this thing up, but it is working very nice and looking real nice. All right, we're gonna come back in and I pulled up the service manual for the SX1250 from Hi-Fi Engine and it laid everything out beautifully as far as what these voltages should be and what we're looking for is 65 volts plus and minus and what I've done is I've connected two meters one to the positive rail one to the negative rail with a common ground between the two of them and that way we can look at the voltages at the same time side by side pretty much and we can see the negative voltage is 66.3 and the positive is 66.2. And we'll go ahead and tweak those down. And because we're in a delicate area, I don't typically use plastic tools, but we will use a plastic one just because I'm in a tight area there. So I want to make sure we don't short anything out. So I guess we'll start off with the very first one here, which I believe is the negative. And let's see if we can tweak that down to 65. Right on the money. And now the positive. Looks to be it. Right on the money. 65 volts positive, 65 negative. I don't believe they give any margin of error here. It is 65 exactly is what they want for that. All right. So now that we got that taken care of, and that was a very simple adjustment to make, you've got plenty of room. If you've got uh, alligator clips for your meters, uh, for your meter probes, then it works out real well. Um, but we got that taken care of. So I think the next thing we'll do, let's have a look at the idle current of both left and right channel. They both feel pretty good, feel pretty equal as far as heat is concerned. So I don't know if they're gonna be too far off if they're off at all, but we will take a look at it. According to the service manual, we want 100 millivolts for left and right channel. So. Let's go ahead and get that started. So give me a second. Let me change the, find the test, pro, test points for that. We'll switch the probes over and we'll have a look at those. All right, so we're picking back up, making our idle bias adjustment and looking in the service manual, as we mentioned, they're calling for 100 millivolts for the adjustment of this and you know, I decided to see what maybe some of the other true experts of these might have to say about that, especially with the age of the unit. 
and look it on Audio Karma. As it turns out, there was a few entries about that and about the, uh, you know, the, the high setting of that at 100 millivolts. And so basically what they had said was they found it to be perfectly fine to set these with the original factory outputs, maybe around 75 millivolts just to, you know, get it to run just a little bit cooler. And I'm actually in agreement with that 100%. 100 millivolts seems high to me. Now this is not hot at all, but again, I haven't touched this. It started out at right what you see right there, 73 millivolts. So I don't know if that's an adjustment that somebody had made to it. I wouldn't think it would have drifted that far, you know, over the years, but it's possible it could have. But anyway, given what these guys were talking about, I think I'm kind of at a mind to go ahead and set both sides at about 75 instead of the full 100. I don't think that's really going to be necessary. Um, maybe back when everything in it was brand new back in the day, then yeah, maybe. But given the age of everything, there's no sense in putting any undue stress on it if not necessary. So the adjustment for this is right front and center right here and it's really touchy as I've already kind of found out just by touching on it, it can move it. So we're going to bring it up slow here. Try to get ourselves in the ballpark. So I think we'll just leave it right at 75. What the gurus on Audio Karma say that uh, is an acceptable compromise between the factory 100 setting and uh, you know the aging of the unit to put it at around 75. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the probes over and we'll take a look at the other side. All right, switching the probes over to the other channel. Seeing this one running at about 80.6, 80.5, 80 80.6. And so, again, not sure if it would have drifted that far over the years if it started out at the factory from 100, but using our recommendation from the other channel, let's go ahead and see if we can tweak it down to 75, and we'll just make it like the other one. I don't really feel any real heat difference between one channel and the other. It could be slightly, just a slight bit warmer, but... Eh. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. Let's see if it drifts. Maybe it'll drift up a little bit. But it always has a tendency to want to drift down, not drift up. So. Very touchy adjustment. No, that's pretty damn good. I don't think I'm going to mess with that. I'll leave that alone. If it sits there, like I said, I'm going to shift between them just to make sure it doesn't do anything crazy. But there it comes. Well, let's tweak it one more time here. Okay, well, I'll be monitoring between the two of them. Again, you're not ever going to get it perfect locked on. It's always going to be drifting a little bit one way or the other, but I think as long as we're in the ballpark, and not only that, since we've kind of decided on a alternate uh, setting, I think that uh, as long as we're within, you know, three or four millivolts, we should be okay. So... I'm going to go ahead and get the other one looked at again. And we'll be ready for putting the lid on and doing a final play test on this. So give me a minute for that and we'll pick back up. 
All right, picking up one last time for a final look at our Pioneer SX1250. Got a top case back on, got the bottom on it. The back grate here looks real good. I was able to clean up the stain that was in the back left here. One of the screws had a little bit of corrosion on it, so I kind of burnished that off. As for the wood, I'm not really into the woodworking thing, but I did put some old English on it, and I think it turned out real nice. You can get a really good look at it from here. And of course, the front of it looking very nice as well. All the buttons turned out beautiful. I can certainly see the interest in these. These are absolutely beautiful receivers. And I can certainly see why somebody would want one of these. But this thing is ginormous. You're going to need a few cinder blocks and a pretty good chunk of wood to set this thing on. Well, I think on the way out, we'll listen to one of my favorite Aerosmith songs. Could be my favorite one. It's from 1974, Seasons of Wither. So let's listen to a little bit of this on this nice Pioneer. I'll go ahead and set you up in the tripod while we listen. As always, I want to thank you guys very much. Appreciate you checking out the videos. And thank you to all the new people that's uh, found the channel. Hopefully you find something of interest here. And uh, we'll uh, pick, back on some, pick back up on something different next week. But until then, let's check out a little bit of this on this old, beautiful old Pioneer. Yes,